Praise Jesus. Praise God. Well, welcome to another Thursday evening, New Destiny. Praise God. I pray that everyone is doing great. We're going to continue to build and dwell on the presence of the Lord and, and just dive into the realities of the kingdom. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you and we give you glory, honor, and praise for who you are. God, I thank you for being an awesome God, for being a mighty God. We thank you for your awesome plan and purpose that is unfolding in this generation. And how do you give us life, God? And how do you bring clarity and insight and instruction, God? Father, we are just so hungry, God, and excited, God, for the fullness of you, God, for greater reality and pulling on you. God, I just thank you for the people that you've ordained and allowed to be alive in this generation, God, to carry a purpose, God, to carry, Lord, your kingdom, to carry a reality into the earth, God, into the othermost parts, God, into homes, into lives, God, into destinies and spheres of jurisdiction, God, and authority, and to destroy the works of darkness, God, and your word declares, God, that so mightily grew the word of God amongst the member of Adam. And we're here, God, this evening, God, to just exalt your word and the revelation that's found therein. And my prayer, God, is that your word would find residence in your people, that it would activate the kingdom, God. My prayer, Father, is in the name of the Lord Jesus, that eyes will be open, ears will be open, God, that hearts will be receptive, God. That the power of Christ, God, would just rest and stir in your people, God, like never before. I thank you, Father, for equipping. I thank you for insight and counsel and for clarity. And for, Father, God, my soul, the lives of the enemy, God, being dispelled, God, and just for spiritual forces, God, that are not of you to be just detached, God, and broken, God, from off your people, God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, and my son, thank you for those who you will draw, God, those, God, who are hungry, those who are open, those who are yet seeking, who are not yet convinced that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. We thank you for a convincing reality of truth. I pray that they hear what they never heard before, see what they never seen before, and feel what they never felt before when it comes to your kingdom, God, your presence, and your power. Thank you for awakening the hungry, God, even your greatest champions, God, in this season, God, and in this generation, God. Thank you for your mighty cross bearers, God, and those who will carry your torch, God, in and throughout the generation, God, your fearless ones, God, that will Father prevail, God, through the blood of the Lamb, God, and through the word of the testimony, and who will not love their lives into the death, Father. We pray that you harden us in truth, God, that you make us resilient in righteousness, God, and Father, that you give us an appetite to embrace the whole role according to Scripture, God. We thank you, God, that the sum of your word is truth, God. And we just exalt you, God. We thank you for the living word, the one that was made flesh and dwelt among us, God, and whom we beheld the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Father, we honor the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for your grace and truth being here today. We thank you for a firm foundation in you and in those that believe, God. And we just give you the praise, the honor, and glory from the place of triumph, from the place of victory, God, from the place, God, where it is finished. In Jesus' name, God, we thank you, and we do pray, and we do decree. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise God. Praise God. Prayer is life. Amen. Well, we honor the Lord's presence and thank everyone for coming. Praise God. And uh, even greater, we thank Jesus Christ for being here. Praise God. And we're going to get into the Word. I hope, hope that you're prepared to catch your spiritual thinking caps on. And I pray that your ears are, are, are just focused and that your hearts are receptive. And I want you to think about what you hear, not just hear what you hear uh, today. I want you to actually think about what's being said. You know, don't just, uh, don't, uh, my, 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 my plea to you is not just to come and just be content that you came, or not just to log on and be content that you heard. But I encourage you to take it a step further and go for retention. Actually think about it, you want praise God. One word makes a difference, but think about what you're hearing and focus on absorbing, internalizing, pulling in and allowing that word to settle and to become alive on the inside. Praise God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you, and we just give you the praise, and we give you glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Jesus said this. He said, take ye how you hear, but with the same measure that you need it. We measure them to you in Mark chapter 4. So we want to take you today. Praise God. We're going to continue to be able to the foundation and the revelation of Zion as is revealed through uh, the power of the Holy Spirit in light of the scriptures. And we've been teaching and studying about judgment, one of the most 
cringed upon, uh, rejected, ran from, misunderstood, mistaught, and misappropriated subjects of the entire Bible is the judgment. Say it with me, judgment. Praise God. And a lot of times that has to do with our ignorance. You know, and when I say ours, I'm just talking about humanity as a whole and sometimes the church. And ignorance simply simply means lack of knowledge. It is not a, a, a belittling or dishonor. It simply means it's an area that we have no light in or that we have no true understanding. Uh, but because of that, and people misinterpret uh, judgment as the evil side of God. Believers don't want to see it. We don't want to embrace it. And the world shakes their fist at God and blames God uh, for everything that we see happening, you know, whether it be uh, people dying, whether it be diseases, whether it be natural disasters, you know, uh, you know, but, you know, judgment is one of those things that we can't afford to not understand because in order to know God and to not be afraid of God, we will have to understand the judgments of the Lord. Say that with the judgments of the Lord. Praise God. Without being fearful, praise God, and without being fear. One of the things that we established, uh, one of the previous teachings, you guys, is that God's judgments are more for us than against us. God's judgments are actually for the world itself. God's judgments are not against man. Uh, they're not against creation, but they are against unrighteousness and evil. And they are restorative graces or restorative powers that restore, uh, for lack of better words, you can say if sin destroys things, if chaos came through, if we've all, uh, if, you know, you had a hurricane recently that hit Panama City. And after Panama was hit, and pretty much before that, we know that Texas was hit as well, you know, by a great storm. Well, what happened is, is that after the storm and after the chaos and after the mayhem and after the disorder and after the brokenness and after all the death and, the, 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 you know, the buildings and the stores and the homes that were swept away, after it was all said and done, somebody had to come and do what? Rebuild. Okay? Somebody had to step on the scene with the vision and with the action to restore. Okay? And that's what judgments do. Judgments come back to restore righteousness. They come back to restore heaven, to restore the reality of God, the reality of evil. They are God's uh, enforcing tools and principles for the restoration of all things. Amen? Praise God. Uh, in other words, when human strength and human might can't do it, praise God, when sure willpower and desire alone, and when evil takes its course and it begins to blossom like a rose, God's judgments will come down to restore order and to restore righteousness on behalf of the Amen? Ain't God a good God? Praise God. The reason, listen, that a lot of people go down is because they end up on the wrong side of God's judgment. Okay? In other words, they, they end up holding on to the thing which God has condemned. Okay? God is condemning the things through his judgment because those things will kill his children. And those things, let's go ahead and make it clear, that's sin. You know, that's sin. There's a difference between righteousness and sin. Amen. The, uh, the apostle uh, John tells us that all unrighteousness is sin. Okay, and so God's judgments come back to restore righteousness and order. So we're going to learn about judgment like you've never heard it before. We're going to learn about it from a balance, from a talk perspective, because in order for the church and in order for the believers and in order for the saints of God to walk in the authority and to carry the weight of the kingdom that God desires for us to carry this generation, we're going to have to have a healthy relationship with this word judgment. Amen. Praise God. And we're going to have to understand that line upon line, precept upon precept, as the Bible says, here a little, there a little. And not just taking one portion of scripture and trying to build an entire reality and doctrine in their mind. Praise God. So let's get into scripture. Somebody say get into scripture. Praise God. We're going to begin the video. I think we were teaching the last, uh, uh, well, I, the Holy Spirit kind of did his thing last week, but, but the week before that, Praise God. We were over in Isaiah chapter 1. We're going to pick back up from a foundation of scripture and continue to be. Praise God. Isaiah chapter number 1. Praise God. Let's go to verse number 20. You can turn it as well. 27. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 27. God just simply signify by saying amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Okay. 
Oh, you too lazy, too lazy. <laughs> Praise God, you got it. They, <laughs> praise God, they're not even opening their books in the classroom. You got them full. They're looking up at the scriptures on the TV screen. You know, that's why you get no amen. Praise God. <laughs> praise God. We thank God for resources. Amen. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 27 says, Zion shall be redeemed with what? Judge. Okay, say that again. Zion shall be redeemed. Okay. Okay. Now, we started the class talking about the reality of Zion. This is Zion Ministries. And from uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, we looked up that word and it meant militant and triumphant church. Okay. Militant and triumphant church. So, when the scripture speaks about Zion, Old Testament and New Testament, it is a, it is a, it is a signification of God is basically. It's symbolic language to represent God's people, God's covenant people. Say they would be covenant people. Okay. And what is a covenant? A covenant is a binding agreement between two parties. Okay. In other words, you're obligated to uphold your side of this contract, your side of this agreement. Okay. You know, you know whatever you know, fine details are in there, praise God. So God has a binding agreement with his people. Okay. You have the old testament and the new one. Come on, talk to me. That's it. You have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament. You have the Old Covenant and the New what? Covenant. You have the Old Binding Agreement, you have the New Binding Agreement. Praise God. So God has a Binding Agreement with his people, covenant people, the, the children of Israel in the Old Testament, but those who believe in Jesus Christ, New Testament, be of the blood of Christ, we have came into a covenant relationship with Christ. Okay? And so the church has an identity called Zion, praise God. And our high calling as the body of Christ is not to be beat up, is not to be taken advantage of, is not to, uh, to, to just, you know, cry and beg and look at the evil and say, I can't wait till I go to heaven. Lord Jesus, you need to hear me come back. You know, that's not God's vision for the church. That's not a glorious triumph of church, okay? Jesus didn't die to leave us weak. Say that again. He did not die to leave us weak and trampled on by the world, by the enemy, by the life, by circumstances, or by demonic forces. Praise God. That's not his vision. And if you are involved in a religious system and you are growing in more weakness and in more defeat and in more deficiency and in more, uh, you know, just escapism, uh, then you may want to connect somewhere else, praise God, so that you can get the vision and get the true heart of what Jesus intended when he said it is finished, praise God. How can you be ordained to be weak and be beautiful? And Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that he quickened us together with him and raised us up together in heavenly places, to sit in heavenly places in his son. Praise God. Far above principalities and powers, thrones and dominion, the word of God says, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And has given him to be the head over all things, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. This is the book of Ephesians. That's the first chapter. Check it out. Praise God. And so you're called to be over all things in the Son. Can you say amen? Praise God. And so God's idea and God's vision and God's heart for us that believe out of every race, kindred, nation, tongue, and people, those who submit to the cross of Christ, who, who come to him, who are born to him, who align themselves and become members of his body, we all have a calling to rise above, to be above only in Christ Jesus and not the name. Praise God. That is what the grace of God purchased for us. Praise God. So the Bible says that Zion shall be redeemed with judgment. Say that with me, with judgment. Okay, so we see that judgment in this particular scripture, people of God, is not being used to destroy us. Judgment is not even a threat in this scripture, right? This is Isaiah chapter 1, verse what? 27. Okay, listen, good, good, good. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 27. Look at it, look at it again. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment. Praise God. Say that with me, with judgment. So judgment comes as a rescue agent to Zion, to the church. Zion, judgment comes as, as, as the tool that comes to get us out of trouble. Okay? 
where we have been overcome and taken and, and kidnapped uh, by the enemy. Praise God. Zion uh, is redeemed by judgment. Okay? And so this is God. This is God's forcible way of helping his body, of helping his children, and helping us. Okay? Now, here's the thing. If I fear this word, okay, then when my when my agent of rescue comes, I may begin to do what? Run. Okay. If I don't understand that judgment is not against me, but judgment is for me. But it's the enemy that wants to trick us as if God's judgments are something to be shown, to be looked down on, to be avoided. Okay? When the truth of the matter is, sometimes judgments from the Lord are the only thing that can break the hold of the enemy off of your life. Sometimes God's judgments are the only things that can restore order in so much chaos. Okay? That can restore God's right way when there's so much confusion. That can restore God's way of doing things, praise God. When, when, you know, when, when you've got a generation or in your mind, you've been through so much and you're beginning to call good evil and evil good, or you got so much of these people in your ear that you begin to kind of almost bleed the lie, and, or we begin to lift the lie, and, and, but God in his goodness comes in. And oftentimes that restorative agent that comes from heaven to set things right, to set things in order, to, to clear the path before us and to show us the right way. Come let us go to Zion, unto the house of the Lord our God, and we will walk in his paths and he will teach us of his ways. Okay? This, this is when God says, you know what? Nothing's enough. This is when decrees from heaven come down when God says, yes, who can say no? Okay? This, this is when God puts his foot down. This is when he stands. And him as the righteous judge releases a decree. Okay? Whether it be pertaining to your life personally, pertaining to a situation, or pertaining to a nation. Praise God. God's judgments are for us. You know how? Because God is for humanity. God is for the earth. Okay? God is for life and that much. God is for health. God is for freedom. God is for deliverance. God is for peace. God is for preservation. God is for us experiencing everything that he created us to experience. And his judgments will come to restore that. Amen? Praise God. Are you getting excited about judgments? Praise God. Praise God. And my prayer, praise God, is through the end of this that, um, that, uh, that, that we begin to actually embrace it, praise God, and stop um, in that time. Uh, a scripture came up in my spirit, you guys. I'm just going to flip, flip, flip to the book of Hebrews real quick. Go to the fourth chapter. I want to... I want to show you something, praise God, in the fourth chapter of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number, let's go to six, six chapter, praise God. This chapter, verse number one and verse number two, okay? And I'm just going to touch on this and we're going to go back to the original thought and teach it in hand. But when it comes to our Christian life, you guys, there are certain foundational things that we have to have or that God intended for us to have in order to be what the Bible calls sound. Say it would be sound. Now, sound is not talking about um, a decimal or some type of noise that you hear in your ear. Okay? That is a definition of sound. But we're not talking about, you know, audio sound. Okay? Sound is another word for wholesome. Say it would be wholesome. Another word for wholesome, W-H-O-L-E-S-O-M-E. -E. Another word for wholesome is healthy or whole. Another word for whole is complete or lacking nothing. Okay? So God wants us sound. Say that with me. God wants me sound. God wants me healthy. God wants me but complete. Say that with me. Complete. Okay? According to his vision and his original intention for you, man. Okay? Matter of fact, in the in, in uh, Jewish uh, tradition, in, in their relationship with God, if you go back and if you study, uh, you, it's even in the book of Ezekiel, but God oftentimes made a covenant of peace, a covenant, a shalom covenant, okay, which is a word that means to have nothing missing and nothing lacking in their life, to have nothing missing and nothing broken. That's spirit, soul, and body. This is why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and the God of peace sanctify you wholly, spirit, soul, and body. 
and may you be preserved blameless even unto the coming of the Lord Jesus. That was a covenant word and a covenant term, praise God, and a covenant thought, you guys, along that line. And so God's will for us is that we be what? Whole and wholesome, right? And so with that in mind, God always has a right way of bringing that about. He has a proper order and he has proper things. He does an efficacy to the king. There's an order, praise God. God is not the author of what? Confusion. Praise God. But in order for things to be made right, there's an order that things have to be addressed and dealt with. And this is why God is a God of beginnings. God is a God of time. Even though God, listen to you guys, even though God is eternal, when it comes to his creation, God has limited himself to establishing beginnings okay, for us. You know why? Because anything that progresses must have a beginning. Okay? Because everything that you evolve into after you have been created, will be according to the strength of your beginning. You will only be as great as your foundation. You will only go as high as your beginning. You will only, you know, even skyscrapers, you guys, they can only they can only continue to be built on and continue to go higher to the degree that the foundation is established. Okay? And so beginnings are so important. Okay? I dare say that if a person does not have a right beginning in Christ, if they don't have a right foundation, it's impossible to be whole. It's impossible to grow up and to be healthy. It's impossible to be wholesome. It's impossible to eventually become complete. Okay? And so one of the things that we look at in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, the writer says, therefore, leaving the principles, say it with me, principles, okay, of the doctrine of Christ. Say it with me, the doctrine of Christ. Okay? Say it a little loud, like you guys. There you go. Praise God. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Okay? Principles. Say it with me, principles. That's a teaching even of itself like right that. So, so here's the thing, you guys. There are certain principles that we should understand. Okay? About the doctrine. That word doctrine means what? Not, not doctrine. Praise God. But doctrine. Doctrine means teaching. Praise God. You're right. It means teaching. So he says, leaving therefore the principles of the teaching of Christ. Say it with me, Christ. Now the word Christ means his anointed, the anointed one and his anointing. Okay? That's what Christ is a Greek word. Okay? Christos, the anointed one and his anointing. Say that with me. The anointed one. Okay? Now that is so important. That term is so important because the Old Testament prophets spoke about the anointed one to come. So they understood the Christ. Another word for Christ is the Messiah. So the, the, the Hebrew word Messiah and the Greek word Christ are pretty much the same word. Just two different vernaculars, two different uh, uh, cultures, two different languages, all speaking about the same person who has the same calling and the same mission, just different word. Okay? And so Christ is the anointed one in his what? Okay? His anointing. Say that again. His anointing. His mashka, which means the smearing or the rubbing, praise God. And so the anointed one is Jesus Christ himself, okay? His anointing is what he oftentimes distributes to those who are in him, okay? Matter of fact, John tells us in 1 John that you have that same anointing which abided in you, and you have no need that any man teach you, for the same anointing that abided in you teaches you all things, Okay? And so the, the anointed one shares his anointing. Amen? Praise God. But didn't that believe? Praise God. All right. Now I'm going to go over. But here's the point. Okay. Therefore, leave the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. Okay. Therefore, leave the principles and enemy of the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine teaching of Christ. This is where we have missed it as a whole. Okay. There have, there have been. There have been so many people who have not yet learned Christ, who have not been taught Christ, who have been taught everything, who have been taught how to prophesy, how to lay hands on the sick, how to evangelize, and, or, or how to do this and how to do that. And we've been given everything but Jesus. Okay? And so a lot of times people get born again, but because there is no orderly structure when it comes to helping them grow. 
and become established in the foundation. People are basically fighting for their lives. They hear this sermon over here and they grab it and swallow it. They hear this on YouTube fighting for their life. Oh, that sounds good. Grab it and swallow it. You get this, you, you, you read this post and you, uh, you go to this conference and, and we're just pulling from everywhere and anything that seems like it will give life. Okay? We go from topic to topic, from subject to subject, from, from exciting thing to exciting thing to, hey, this might be the problem, so I think I need to focus on this. And I talk to my friend, and I see where they are. They said I need to be over here looking at this, and maybe if I learn this right here, that would be And so we're everywhere. Okay? We're everywhere. Praise God. Because discipleship is no longer a thing that's important to a lot of people. You know why discipleship is not important? Because discipleship takes time. Discipleship takes time and intentional investment. Jesus ministered to multitudes. He sent 70 out, but he walked with 20 for three and a half years. Okay? And he closely invested in them as his disciples. Okay? Praise God. And so discipleship is the way for us to grow. Okay? It's the way for us to grow. People are not being disciple. Praise God. People are not even understanding the importance of discipleship. We bought this doctrine, you guys, that I don't need anybody. Nobody can tell me anything. I got the Holy Spirit. I don't need man. Say it with me. Man, you heard it before. I don't need man to teach me anything. That is one of the most, one of the most ignorant things that I ever heard. In this context, we understand that flesh cannot help us, you guys. But we do realize that God anoints men and women. God has sent some in the church to equip the body. Okay? We do realize, praise God, that God uses men. He uses church. He uses people. Praise God to help us. That God lives in his people. And God's spirit is in his people. And when people yield to the Holy Spirit, it's not man. It's God. Say it It's God. Okay? So the thing that I can grow and become solid and whole apart from any impartation or anybody helping me is pride and just great deception. Okay? You will find that even though knowledge may increase, nature won't increase. When I'm talking about nature, I'm talking about the nature of Christ and the appropriate proper character and the way of doing things as a believer. Okay? For example, lack of humility, very dishonorable, no integrity. Will say anything out of order, you know, just 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 things, praise God, that nature and that fellowship will help preserve us from from being properly connected with other members and being submitted. Okay, this is what I learned when it comes to leadership. When you find people that refuse to submit to others, praise God, and they, they buy that doctrine and they say, you know, you don't need the man, we don't need man teachers anything. You know, no man, all I need is God, all I need, and they're posting, they're putting it out there, but they won't you to listen to them. Okay? Listen, if you sow dishonor, you'll reap dishonor. Okay? If you sow dishonor, you'll reap. Okay? In other words, if I can't humble myself and submit, praise God, then God is not going to put anybody up under your shadow to teach in your time of exaltation. Okay? Because you will never receive what you refuse to give. Okay? We will never get or reap what we don't suffer. So how can I want someone to listen to me? But I'm preaching a doctrine to don't listen to any man as if I am not a homo savior. Okay? You see, do you see the double set? And this is why in this hour, believers have to be wise as a serpent. Harmless as a dove. We have to have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. I don't care how many followers they got or what's going on or what type of influence. You got to have a trained ear to hear his shepherd, to hear the shepherd, and to hear his voice. Yeah. And so it's important, you guys, that we begin to get plugged in personal testimony. When I first got, uh, got incarcerated, I was going through demonic attacks left and right. I mean, I, I had spirits, man, they were, they were, I mean, they were manifesting, they were biting on me, they were jumping on me, and I was, I was about 24, and I was used to the street life, because I came out of the games and stuff, but, but this stuff, the spiritual stuff was a whole lot more, okay, and I had so many people that thought that I had lost it, and thought that I was crazy, and I was trying to tell them what was going on, and I would pretty much just get brushed, and I was fighting a very real battle, okay, there was one man, one brother, his name was Jonathan, 
that, that I still, I, I love giving this testimony because I believe in giving honor to where honor is due. Okay? Jonathan was of uh, the praise and worship leader. Praise God. And I was sit down with Jonathan, you guys. And here I was. I was going through such an intense spiritual battle that I was literally afraid to go to sleep. Okay? I was afraid to go to sleep because of the manifestations and because of the torment and because of everything that would happen. And I didn't understand. I was a babe in Christ. Praise God. I had no foundation. Okay? And so I gravitated to him because what Jonathan would do, Jonathan would get off after working eight hours. He would get off about 11 or 12 and say, hey, John, give me a break tonight. Okay? He would say, sure. And I would go up and meet him on the hump when everybody was supposed to be asleep, and I would lock hands with him like a child. Okay? And Jonathan would begin. And I, would, I didn't even have the confidence to pray. I didn't even trust that my prayers would even be heard, you know? I didn't even think that my prayers would make a bit of a difference, but I will, I will say, oh, Jonathan, can we pray? And I will lock hands with Jonathan, and Jonathan will begin to pray, and I will pull strength, and I will pull strength, okay? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say a word. I just sit there and pull and soak up. I did this for almost a year, and he never got tired, okay? But without that fellowship, without the humility to submit to him, I wouldn't be here today, okay? He was a lifeline, God in him, and he didn't have all the answers. He, matter of fact, he said, he said, I don't know what you're going through, brother. He said, but, you know, I, I know one brother that was called the office of a prophet. He went through things similar. I didn't, I didn't pay any attention. I just was glad to get the prayer. I don't know the I just, thank you. Thank you for the prayer. You know what I mean? This is, my, this is my point, you guys. Five years later, I ended up being his pastor and pastoring him and the rest of the church. Okay, for years. But I started out in submission. Okay? Here he was, here I was shaking and afraid. And I had to go to him to submit. Okay? To his prayer, to submit to his relationship with God, to submit to his leading, to submit to the anointing that was in his life to help strengthen me. Amen? You guys get the picture? To help strengthen me. As a result of being able to submit to him and others, I began to grow in the fellow. I began to get strong. And the same one that I was begin that I submitted to at one point became submitted to me humbly from the heart as I pastored him and God used me to lead him into even greater realities. Do you see how it works? God has set this thing up so you guys that nobody gets the glory. That no flesh glories in his sight of his presence. That nobody can say, hey, look what I did, and, and look who I am, and, and look at me. Praise God. Praise God. But God wants us all submitted and properly connected to one another. Amen? Praise God. And that's the beauty of Christ, where the Bible says that no flesh will glory in his presence and in his sight. Praise God. And those who really take the path of humility, they flourish in the course of the Lord. Those who feel as if they're the only Christian on earth with any portion of truth, praise God, become so inclined and driven by the spirit of error, praise God. And they become more destructive, praise God, than productive for the king and his king. Amen? I don't know who that was for, but praise God. Let's get back over here to the salvation. He says this, and leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, of the teaching of Christ, as the spirit of the Lord was emphasizing, there's so many believers who have not been taught Christ. Okay? Christ Jesus Christ is probably one of the most uninteresting, unattractive teachings and realities of the church in our town. Okay? We like cameras. We like lights. We like, we, you know, we like smoke coming out. We like you know, we like we like something. We like get my attention. You know, and and we have confused. We have confused technology. We have confused. Uh, you can say events and just and, and just different things going. On. We have confused that with the anointing of God being present. Praise God, because we have been desensitized by something to not know the Christ and His anointing, the anointed one in His anointing. Okay. And so we're, we're, uh, what's going on is that, that there's a generation of believers that are coming forth and they're not being taught the importance of knowing him first. Okay? They can't, they're, it's not time for them to leave the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. You know why? Because they have never went there. Okay? 
See, Paul is talking to the Hebrew Christians. He said, okay, you have been established. You have been taught Christ. You have been groomed in him. You have been lined up online school. You have been precept upon precept about who he is, about who he was before the Father, before the foundation of the world, about him becoming flesh, and about his purpose, his mission, his origin, about the cross, about the crucifixion, about his resurrection, about his coming judgment, about, you know, you, 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 you know this. Now it's time to build upon that and move on to other realities. You guys understand? Okay. Those are the principles of the doctrines of Christ. Principles are founding things that hold other things up. They're things that you build off of. Foundations. Okay? What we have to do, you guys, is that you have to take the time to become attracted to Jesus again. You have to take the time. I know people are doing a lot of things. I know that there's a lot of teaching. There's a lot of things that may seem more important. That may seem more important. And listen, you guys, that's not to say that because all truth is progressive. Truth is alive. Say it with me. Truth is alive. Truth is eternal, right? Say it with me. Truth is eternal. Okay. Paul, I mean, Peter said this. He said, being born again, not of the corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed of the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Okay. So the word of God lives and abides. How long? That means it's progressively expanding. It's progressively growing. And so truth evolves. Okay? But truth in Christ does not become truth of the end. It becomes a byproduct of its root of its beginning. Okay? So all truth that begins in Christ will end in Christ. I don't care if it becomes prophetic or if it's healing, if it's deliverance, if it's whatever, praise God. If it begins in Christ, everything that we grow and evolve into will always still point to him and be done in and through his spirit. Okay? But what happens is, is that when we don't start right with Jesus, and when people take us uh, too fast and too far for too long and in the wrong direction in the beginning, that's when people's spiritual life crash. Okay? That's what shipwreck happens along that line. Okay? When we become too, too, we're, we're, we're moving too fast, you know. Praise God. And we have not become established in Him. Okay? God wants us to take the time to get to know the anointing in His anointing. Okay? If you don't get to know Jesus, if we don't get to know Jesus, we will never do things for the right reason. Okay? If we don't uh, take the time to get to know Jesus, we will not do this. We won't walk this Christian life in the walk right spirit for the right reasons. Okay? You want to do, you know, listen, you want to live your life from that place of intimacy with him. You want to live your Christian life, walk out that reality, whatever he's called you to do, from the place of communion with him. Okay? I'm not talking about uh, the, 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 the fourth Sunday or the first Sunday, that type of communion. I'm talking about the communion of his presence, the communion of the Holy Spirit, the communion of his spirit. The Bible says in First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, he that is joined into the Lord as one spirit. I'm talking about from that reality right there, that oneness, that intimacy, that union with him, that knowing. Okay? Praise God. <clears throat> Oh Lord, this is this is a whole other direction. You, you know, you guys, we, we have to begin to see Jesus as worth knowing. Okay? Think about this right here. When it comes to issues, when it comes to problems, who do you run to first? When it comes to situations that seem unresolved or maybe overwhelming, who do we go to first? Okay? Now you're saying Jesus, but I'm saying think about in our life first, who do we go to first? Okay? Who do we go to first? Okay? And if we know that we're supposed to go to Jesus first, then when we realize that he is the Lord, when he is the, he is the Lord, he's the greater in me than he that is in the world. He's the God of all power. He is the Lord of all. Praise God. Why don't we go to him first? Okay? If he has all power, he has all answers, he has all authority, he, he rose from the dead, he said, all power is given unto me where? In heaven and earth. He said that for a reason. Because he wanted us to pull from him and to draw on him. The reason, you guys, that we don't go to him first is because we have learned principles and not Christ. 
We have learned the value and the importance of just doctrines and teachings and, 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 and five steps to this and, and three keys to that and, 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 and all of these things that have their place, but they are not foundation. Okay? They are not foundation. Okay? Praise God. And we have not so much as learned Christ. Praise God. It's important to learn Christ. Amen? Praise God. Listen, we can talk to him. And he can talk to us. Okay? He can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And we can share with his birth. Okay? You know, the Bible says this that faithful are the wounds of a what? A friend. You can be friend him. And you can experience his heart. Okay? He can be communed with and fellowship with. Okay? His presence in person can be enjoyed. Okay? And this is what we have to strive for. Through the truth of God's word. We have to strive to know him. Say that with me. Strive to know him. Strive we within our seat. We have to strive to know him, you guys. Okay. Because the strength of your position is not in believing, it's in knowing. Okay? And so we have to strive to know him. Everything that you can think about is going to try to distract your attention or pull you away the moment. The circumstance, the pressure, the limited time to get results, all of that is going to, going to be warring for your focus, for your attention, and for your investment, boredom, just being tired, the flesh not wanting to, to even deal with you, getting in the word and it seeming bland, and when you read it, you can't understand anything, and then you get a call or get distracted, or, or you want to pick up a book to go to something a little bit more interesting to find a shortcut to know that God can only be known through commitment and relationship. There are no shortcuts to knowing God. That's not a book in this world. Praise God. I don't care how anointed. I don't care how many results. I don't care how many miracles, how many people are blessed by. There is not a book in this world that can suffice for personal relationship, time and commitment, and getting along with God and saying, God, show me your face. We've been taught to praise systems and praise churches and praise pastors and praise leaders and praise apostles and praise prophets and praise ministries and praise organizations and praising everybody but Jesus from a sincere heart and striving to be in every place and everything that's going on except for in his presence. Saying, Lord, I want to know you. Show me who you are. Praise God. This is what we got to return back. This is what we got to go back to. We got to go, we got to start right here, you guys. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. This is a sad thing, you guys, on the spirit of the Lord's heart. This is a very sad thing. You know why? Because he was telling the Hebrew, uh, uh, he was telling the Hebrew Christians that you've been here too long. Okay? It's time to go on to something high. Okay? But 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 what's going on in our day? We hadn't been there to begin. So we're behind. Okay? Christian, we're behind. Because Jesus is rarely heard, taught, preached, or desired in church anymore. Okay? We don't know anything about him in death. Okay? We know he came, he died, and he rose, and that salvation is through him. But what else? Can I tell you something? The entire New Testament, if you just read it for what it is, is about what else? It's about so many mysteries. It's about so many truths. It's about reconciliation and redemption and righteousness. It's about so many putting on Christ and, and the new nature and his coming judgment and who we are in him and, and all that, that he's made available in and through us and what happened at the cross and, and even his ascension and, and he, oh, oh, don't get to the book of Hebrews and everything that he did when he entered back into heaven. Praise God. In the book of Hebrews, the Lord says, Behold, I come in the volume of the book. To do thy will. Think about that. The volume of the entire book, you guys, is consumed or is concealed in him. That's what the Lord said. He said, I, he was telling the Father, Lord, I come in the volume of the book to do thy will. The book is written to me. 
It's pointing to it. It's all about me. And I'm being made manifest in the flesh to walk out the reality of what these people are reading each and every day. God does not want us to grab that. Listen, you guys, and not know him. Okay? Does that make sense? Got to grow. Praise God. I'll share this with you real quick because it's a script that the Holy Spirit uh, just brought up. And I pray that you hear this in the right, 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 right line. Praise God. Go to John chapter 5. Keep your place right there in Hebrews chapter 6. Because we're going to come back to that. Might as well let judgment go. Praise <laughs> God. Let judgment go. Until next time. Praise God. John chapter number 5. All right. When you got to just say amen. Verse Praise one. God. Verse one. No, we're gonna start at verse number thirty-six. Thank you. John five thirty-six. This is Jesus speaking. Say it with me, Jesus. I'm a Jesus man. Praise God. Everybody knows I love the supernatural. Praise God. But it all began. I'm going to continue. To if I have anything to do remain, praise God. John 5, 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness to me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself which has sent me hath borne witness of me. Okay? What is he talking about? When he says the Father also which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. When did the Father bear witness of Jesus? When he was baptized in the river Jordan. The Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord came from heaven, the heavens opened, and the Spirit of the Lord lighted upon it, and a voice came from heaven saying, What? Well done. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am what? Well pleased. That was when the Father was very witness of the Son before all of humanity. And guess what it made the Son feel good? It made him feel good. He went back and said, and the Father himself is more witness to me. Y'all can reject me all you want. Okay? Yeah, I know you guys are trying to kill me there, but the Father himself has more witness to me. You remember that voice. <laughs> you heard that voice. You pretending like, yeah, yeah, that's what he was saying. So you heard that voice. The Father himself. Don't pretend that you don't know who I am. The Father himself has borne witness to me. Okay? If you go back and read the account, some were just trying to make excuses of where the voice came from and who it was that spoke. But it was the Father. The Father himself had borne witness of me. Uh, verse 37. And the Father himself, which has sent me, had borne witness of me. He said, you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Okay? You see it? You see that, guys? He said they had neither what? Heard his voice at any time. Or seeing his what? Okay? Okay. So, the two things that God had against them, or that he accused them of, is that they didn't hear his voice. Hear his voice. And they had not seen his what? Shape. Hmm. Who is he talking to? The people? He was talking to the scribes and Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the day. These were people who taught the Bible. They didn't just teach the Bible. They had the entire Bible in them. Okay? That and the law. And so. Okay? So these were teachers or doctors of the law. These were people who knew scripture. Say it would be new scripture. They knew scripture in their sleep. They knew everything word for word. So they were the teachers. You know how we have to flip through Bibles and stuff? Okay? They wore what you call phylacteries at times to learn scripture. Phylacteries, you know, in Proverbs chapter 4, when it tells us to keep the word ever before your eyes, turn out right to the left or to the right. Well, the way that the Jewish people did it, they wore what was called phylacteries. And they were like little kids. And the scriptures coming over their forehead, they would walk and they would see the scriptures. That's how they meditated on the word of God. Very, very diligent in the 
and, and committed and, and just zealous when it came to learning the word high reverence and high value for the word. Okay. It was said that even when 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 uh when, when doctors of the law, when they wrote scriptures and when they were making scrolls, anytime that they got to the word Jehovah or Yahweh, that they were made seven times before they wrote it. Every time that they got to. Okay. And so high records for the word and their and their and their, and their, and their, their diligence to grow. But in that they still miss it. Okay. He was talking to scribes and Pharisees, and his accusation against them, when it came to them, he said that, you don't know the Father. And he said two things against them. He said, because you have neither heard his voice, and you have neither seen his what? So when, when, when Jesus was pointing to them not having a relationship, what did he equate it to? Not hearing, his voice. not hearing God's voice and not perceiving his shame. In other words, Jesus said this in the book of John chapter 4, that the hour coming kind of now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father, where? In spirit and in truth. Okay? So when it comes to personal relationship, God wants you to be able to hear him, to hear the Son, and he wants you off the eyes of your heart open as well to proceed. Okay? God didn't want us to begin to try to imagine. Okay? No, God is not in active imagination. You're imagining who God is. You're imagining God being there. You're imagining because anything that has its origin in man is a work of the flesh and will become a vain imagination and an entry in a portal for demonic counterfeits. Okay? There's a difference between you imagining. You can't imagine what God looks like. God can use the recesses of your imagination to impart vision. He can do that. He can use it. In, let me say that again. You can't initiate God. You can't initiate vision into God's work. Okay? That is that is new age. Okay? That is stepping out in your own power. That is something that has its origin in the will of man and in the mind of man. And that is an open portal for demonic deception and countenance. What you can do is you can humble yourself and say, God, open my eyes. Father, open my eyes of my heart. Lord, open the eyes of my spirit. Father, bring light, God. Allow me to see. Praise God. God will honor that. Amen. God, listen, God is in what begins in him and not in what begins in us. Okay? And so when it comes to that, they had neither heard his voice and they had neither seen his shape. Okay? Now, now, new age and, and psychics and, and, and those who are in witchcraft, they teach you about the power of the mind, the power of reason, the power of thinking. Okay. The power of perceiving, the inner power to be able to, to, to see things and, and see yourself there. Praise God. But you know what, you guys? That is a very dangerous, dangerous practice in art. It really is. Okay? Because what they're trying to teach you to do is to engage the invisible world of on your own accord. You initiate. Okay? But let me say you something. If you go there alone, you're going to stay there alone. Mm -hmm. Okay? Without Christ. Okay? Because he's not going to come in to, to endorse what you're doing. Okay? The Bible says that the spirit of truth, thank you, Lord. The Bible says that when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will lead you and guide you into what? Say it a little All truth. Okay? When Jesus said in John chapter, matter of fact, he talks about the spirit of truth in John chapter 14, 15, 16. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will lead you and guide you into all truth. Okay? That's the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, when you look at that word true in this original definition, that word is tough. It means it's translated as realities. Okay. So we're talking about spiritual realities being discovered by the believer through the leading of God's spirit. Okay. But notice that the order is that he has to lead you into those realities. He has to lead us into the invisible realities. Not you go there on your own. He didn't say if you take off without the Holy Spirit, he'll come along and tag along to be there with you. No, he didn't say that. He said when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, you sit down, you humble yourself, you wait on the teacher and your master, and you let him lead you and guide you to these things because he knows the world. He knows the realm. He knows the enemies. He knows the tricks. He knows the devices, and you don't know anything about where you are or where you're going. He's a tour guide into spiritual reality. And so it's important that we don't self-initiate. Say it with me, don't self-initiate. 
But it's also important that we don't settle for the letter of the word. Because the Bible says that the letter killeth, but the spirit gives life. Say that with me, the spirit gives life. And that's the balance. That's the balance. Praise God. It's not that God wants to keep the invisible world from us. It's not that he wants to keep your spiritual eyes blind to where you can't see God. He just wants the Holy Spirit to be the source of your revelation, the source of your vision. He wants him to be responsible for removing the veils and the curtains from off your eyes and say, behold the Lamb. Praise God. All that points back to relationship. And how valuable the Holy Spirit is unto us. Okay? And so he rebuked the religious leaders of the day. He said, You don't know the Father. He said, You have neither heard his voice at any time, and you have not seen his shape. You're pretending to have a you're pretending to know him. You're just reading the letter of the law, and you're pretending to be an oracle and a mouthpiece for God. You're pretending to be God's leaders and to be a, a, you know just, just a spokesman from God, and you have no real connection. They had no relationship. They had no foundation. They had the word. They didn't have his heart. Because they had no connection. And when we change you guys, quick fixes. Say to me, quick fixes. What I call quick fixes, you guys, is going to others. I'm not talking about because you need to be connected, you need to be taught, you need to learn. No, I'm talking about when we when we look at man, we, we will go to videos, we will go to books. Okay. But you should be able, you should go to the places that push you closely, that help you and wean you. You need we need to be help and wean. Say that with me, help and wean. We need to be strengthened, encouraged, and exhorted and pushed closer to him. Everything needs to be going back to him. Back to him. Be you grounded and rooted and built up in him. The Bible says. Praise God. So the goal is Christ, is to be conformed into his image and into his likeness and to have the nature of Christ formed in us. So Paul said. My little children, I've grown and travailed in pain together until now, until Christ is formed in you. Okay? Paul's, listen, Paul's agenda was not that they praise him. It's what, he wasn't trying to build a mega church. He wasn't trying to get followers or, 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 or people to, to listen to him. He was trying to get Christ, the nature of Christ, formed in the disciples and in them that believe. Just like a baby, praise God, evolving in the womb. Nine months. That's how the nature of Christ in the new creation nation needs to begin to form on the inside of us. Praise God. And that's what ministers and that's what teachers and preachers and leaders are here to do. Not to become your identity. Not to steal your identity. Not to try to become Christ in your life. But to help feed the nature of Christ within you until Christ is formed in you. Praise God. There's only one Jesus. Praise God. He's in heaven. Amen. Praise God. So it says, listen, you guys, that they had neither seen his shape. Wow. So God wrote it there. So when it comes to relationship, listen, God opened our ears to hear his voice. Say that it be his voice. His voice. Okay. There's a difference between hearing his voice and somebody telling you that you are hearing his voice. Have you learned the difference? Have you learned the difference between when he is there versus when somebody is saying he's there? Have you learned the difference? Okay? Just because I said God told me doesn't mean that it's his voice. Just because I say thus saith the Lord doesn't mean that it's his voice. Just because I have a title or a minister or because there are a lot of people upon me just because they fall out and shout uh, doesn't mean that it's his voice. Have you learned to hear his voice? And not just being told that you're hearing his voice. Okay? Jesus said that my sheep hear my voice. Okay? I go before my, in the voice of a stranger, they will not do what? There's a distinct sound. There's a distinction in his voice. It has to come from relationship. Okay? You shouldn't depend on people to tell you what God is speaking. You should know who God is speaking. Because God is out. The Bible says in the, oh God, son, Galatians chapter 5, for he has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying Abba Father. Okay? The spirit of his son is on the inside. 
You got us? Cry, Abba Father. Okay. And so they didn't hear his voice. But the people were in slavery and in bondage to their religious system because they boasted of being spokesmen of God. But because of our son, because the people were, uh, didn't have the ability to be able to hear from themselves, praise God, they were deaf. They had ears, but they could not hear. And the enemy was able to rob them, to oppress them, to use them, and to, to, and to extort them in the name of religion or in the name of the word of God without the spirit. Okay? Or with leaders who possess not a personal relationship. Okay? But Jesus came into the earth connected. Say it with me, connected. And this is, the, uh, this is why the entire religious system was afraid of them, because they couldn't control. They couldn't control. He didn't live for their honor. He didn't live for their acceptance. He lived from the reality of relationship. He said, I only see I only do what I see my father do, and I only speak when I hear him speak. Listen, hearing and what? Seeing. Okay? They didn't hear his voice. They didn't see his shape. He came into the earth. He said, I only say what I hear my father say, and I only do what I see my father do. If it was good enough for Jesus, if it was the right path for the Son of Man, if it was the right order of living for the word that became flesh, then it was the perfect example and prototype for you and I. Okay. He's the foundation. Okay. His life, praise God, sets the expectation for everyone that's born of him. And okay. he's the first born from the dead. Okay. But not the last. And so if that is how Jesus functions, God never intended that you depend on books or on props or on the expectation of the approval of others. All of that should be helping you grow and becoming closer to him. Praise God. It should be increasing your ability to hear him and increasing your ability to see what he is doing and to pattern. Amen. That's what the Bible calls relationship. Amen. Praise God. Verse 38. That ain't where I'm going. <laughs> and you have not his word abiding in you. For whom he has sent, you believe not. When he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees, listen, Josiah, and they were full of the word, man. They were full of the letter. Say it with me, the letter. They were full of the doctrine. They were full of, of, of just teaching. Praise God. And man's interpretation. You know, human interpretation, you know, the word of God with, with human wisdom. You know, with the mind of man, it's just being interpreted. But listen, you guys, it was the tree of knowledge of good evil. There were two trees in the garden. Okay? Remember, you guys, that what began to happen is that he told them to stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good evil. Satan came to tip them. He said, you know what? If you eat of this tree, you'll be wise. You'll be as God's, Lord King Jesus, knowing good and evil. God is holding something from you. That's what he told him. Go get it. Okay. That was the temptation. God is holding a better life for you. Go get it. There's more in you. You don't have to just be limited to his will and to his way of doing things. There's more for you to experience. There's more to your potential. Go get it. Go get it. Okay. See, the enemy became the first tempter of man functioning and initiating things apart from God, trying to know God or trying to be better. Okay? That is the greatest human problem that you can ever think of. And that always leads to death. Okay? And so they went and got knowledge. And the knowledge looked good. The fruit looked good. It was, it was, it was attracted to the eyes. And they, it was, the Bible said that it was, it was attracted to it. And they desire. Okay. And so what happens, you guys, is that when we deal with the letter of the word, it sounds good. And it may be in the scripture. But there was no life. God is not the source. It has this root in the pride of man, in human will. And thoughts that did not originate in heaven. Okay. And a heart that's unsubmitted. 
who allow their own mind to become the pattern or to become the standard of reference when it comes to truth. Okay? Let me say something. There's a difference between information and truth. There's a difference between information and revelation. You know what the difference is? You can research all you want. We're about to read this. You can get in there. You can grab your books. You can do this. You can do that. And, and you know, just because people are intelligent and they think that, you know, say, well, that don't make sense. Well, just because it don't make sense doesn't mean it's not God. Okay? God, now, listen, your sense and your ability, your intellect never was the standard. Our intellect didn't die for anybody. Our intellect was not crucified. Our intellect didn't shed any blood. Okay? Our intellect is ever evolving. Okay? And so the first thing that we have to do in order to hear his voice and to perceive his faith is to develop a heart of humility. Okay? And to become teachable when it comes to the teacher of the Holy Spirit. To be able to humble myself up under the mighty hand of God. Okay? That's the first key. Because the teacher will not appear until the pupil is willing to be taught. Okay? The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that your teachers will no longer be hidden in the corner. Okay? But your teachers shall appear. Okay? And you'll begin to hear them and receive from them. So what happens is, you guys, is that we have to develop some humility because the difference between information and gathering is that the enemy will make things make sense, but sense can never make life. Okay? And that's what Adam and Eve experienced when they built the fruit. Things made so much sense, but the sense that they came to the knowledge of led to death. And the minute that they begin to depend on anything apart from God, they begin to die. And ever since then, man has been ever evolving, trying to figure out the importance and the source of life. So many philosophies, so many doctrines, so many teachings, so many things that originate in the mind of man. Psychology. Past life regression. You got so many just different, crazy, philosophical things out there that originate in institutions of man and then also religious institutions. They have their root simply in pride and self will But when it comes to revelation, okay, the Greek word is apocalypse. Okay, and it means to unveil. It means to remove the curse. Okay? It means that, you know what, it's almost like Christ is right. It's there. But all you got to do is stay put. And at an important time, God removes the veil. And he allows the light to shine. He allows the light to shine. You don't have to work. You don't have to strive. You can't break your way behind the curtain. You can't make yourself understand you. And you can't make yourself go get it. You have to sit humbly, position yourself, and let light come. Let revelation come. Let the Lord speak. Let the Lord reveal. And all of a sudden, your eyes see. And all of a sudden, your ears will begin to hear. But it begins with the proper posture of the heart and mind. Okay. Thank God. When we value revelation, we're way on it. When we value revelation, we'll do what? We'll wait on it. You go back and study the entire life of Daniel. This was a man that understood the order of life, the order of revelation. He was not content with information. This man positioned himself for what? Revelation. If you go back and if you study the book of Daniel culture, you'll find out that he first started in the land. It says that he was reading the book of Jeremiah. Say that with me, reading the book of Jeremiah. So he started out studying the book and he saw the prophecy where God had promised that after 70 years that he was supposed to bring his people out of captivity and out of bondage. Okay? And guess what? The 70 years was about up. And so Daniel began to pray, and Daniel began to fast and say, hey, what is this? Okay. I see the letter, but now I need the spirit. Now I need, and he began to position himself for revelation. He sat still. He mourned. He prayed. He fasted. He ate no pleasant food time and time again for 21 days. What was he doing? Waiting on the Lord. Waiting for light. We see the angel Gabriel coming several times, bringing truth, bringing insight, making him know the understanding of the visions of his head on the bed, on the night. He didn't try to figure that stuff out. God brought revelation and light because he waited, because he valued, because he positioned himself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. 
Mugam Sagasi. I'm going to say that again. Pray about 15 minutes. God bless. Pray that. It says that you have not heard his voice at any time. Ooh. I said, ooh. So he was saying, listen, you guys have done this for years. And at one time have you been connected. This is the potential to build one. A person can spend an entire lifetime building religiously and not know God. Invest in everything and these were leaders with great respect. But he told them, he said, in all that you've done, and in all that you put your hand to, and in all that you've established, and all that you've said, you have neither heard his voice or seen his shape at any time. You've never been a connected. You've never been a spokesperson for my father. You've never had his authority. You have never spoken. He has never spoken for you. That's what he's telling Hard words. Praise God. Especially for them. Verse 38. He said, and you have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him, you believe not. Let's listen, guys. Now, they had the letter in them. But Jesus accused them of not having his word. Can you see that? Okay. He said, if you have not his word abiding in you. Say that with me. Abiding in you. Now, John chapter 15, Jesus tells the disciples, in us, he said, abide in my word, and my word abide in you. Okay. And you shall ask what you will, and it shall be given. There's something to this abiding in his word. He's talking about having it more than in our hearts, you guys. But the word of God coming alive on the inside of us. And in order for it to come alive, you got to take time with it, germinate it. You, you can't, when it comes to growing, you can't run to a lot of different things. Because if you, if you continually run into a lot of different things and run into a lot of different truths and run into a lot of different, they got this going on over there. In, in the meantime, when you're running, you're neglecting the very thing that you just planted. It don't just take care of itself. No more than a seed that you planted outside in a garden takes care of itself. Okay? You realize that there's some cultivation, there's some things that you have to do in order to foster the growth to full maturity. You have to protect it and invest it. Say that it be protected and invested. Okay, all truth that you receive that's important to you, learn to protect it and learn how to invest it. Okay? Because that's how you cause it to, to grow and to fully blossom and to mature. God. You have not his word abiding in you. And it says, For he whom he hath sent, you believe not. Okay? Now they didn't have the word abiding in them, but they had the letter in them. Okay? They had the letter in them. This was a great, great, great rebuke unto the religious leaders. You know, but it was a great sober truth if they had ears to hear, because they could make the proper alignment and, and get things in proper order. Okay? With the heart of humility, they would have went on to say, well, what do you mean? Or how do I get this word of body to me? Or, or help me, Master, help me understand more. And Jesus would have instructed. But when he spoke this, it, it, it struck a chord and it said pride. They became angry. They became indignant. Who do you think he is talking about that kind of word? I'm you know, older than him. And we are the Sanhedrin. You know, we are the council. I don't have a word in me. I've been teaching for years. And so he said, because they didn't have his word about it. He said, for he whom he has sent, you believe not. I'll touch this real quick and we're gonna we're gonna move on, you guys. What he was saying is that the father is speaking through me. And if he was in you as well. You would recognize who's speaking. Mm -hmm. You would recognize that it's not me, that it's him. The reason that I know he's not in you, because you can't recognize him speaking for me. That's what Jesus was saying. Okay. Because remember, he said, I only do when I hear my father, when I see my father do, I only speak when I hear him speak. And so, verse 39. This is a very eye-opening scripture, you guys. Changed my life forever. Jesus told him this. 
He said, search the scriptures. Say that with me. Search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. He said, for in them you think. Key word is think. Say that with me, think. That's right. A lot of times, you guys, our problem is a mind gone wild. Thinking that's out of a lie. Thinking, thinking is where the pride is. See, reason. Reason, man. See, we have to, you know, there's a reason that the Lord said, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Trust keeps you from allowing your mind to go places that it's not supposed to go. It's only when we don't trust God in a situation that we come out of that place of submission and humility and your mind begins to try to figure things out. See, when it comes to trust, you can rest even your mind and keep your mind subjected to the Holy Spirit because when it comes to trust, you don't have to know how God is going to do it. You don't have to know the answer. You don't have to know when. You don't have to know the way. Because you trust that he's got you. And everything will be brought to pass or everything will be revealed in due time. So you're not as tempted to come out of that place of submission and those thoughts go to race. He told him, search the scriptures. For in them you think. In them you think. Okay? Say that with me. In them you think. So they approach the scriptures from an analytical position. They approach the scripture from an intellectual position. They approach the scripture from the reason, from the mind of man, from a mental position. But they should have approached it from a heart of humility and a place of submission to the teacher. Wow. One brings the false light. Okay. One brings the true life. One brings the tree of the knowledge of good evil, evil. The other brings life. One brings the spirit of this world. The other brings the spirit which is of God. Okay. One brings information. The other one brings revelation. He says, search the scriptures. For in them, he's talking to them. For in them you think that you have eternal life. Okay. And he went on to say this that shook the world forever. Still shaking me today. He said, for in them, say that with me, in them. In them, he's talking about the scripture. He said, in them you think you have eternal life. Say that with me. In them you think you have eternal life. In them, according to context, he's talking about the scriptures. Okay? Say that with me. He's talking about the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. Okay. And because they thought that life was in the scripture themselves, they began to invest all of their effort, all of their emotion, all of their attention, and all of their labor and investment in the scriptures because in the scriptures they thought was eternal what? Life. But eternal life is not in the scriptures. Eternal life is in the Son. Eternal life is in the Son. Jesus, Jesus said something that shocked him. He said, it is the scriptures that testify of who? They point you to me. They point you to a living relationship. They point you to the man. They point you to intimacy. They point you to the great I am. They point you to eternal communion. They point you unto the author of eternal life. They point you unto the power of another Indian life. They point you to my divine nature that you may part of. They point you to the bread of heaven. Okay? Because remember, uh, Jesus began to talk, and they began to talk about, well, Moses gave a bread from heaven. Jesus said, Moses didn't give me a bread from heaven. My father gave me a bread from heaven. Then he said, I am the true bread. They came down from heaven to give life to the Lord. If you eat of me, you won't die. I am the true water of life. If you drink of me, you won't thirst again. They didn't want him. And so he will say, the scriptures are they which testify of me. Say what you mean. God. And this is, listen, so he, he, he made a distinction between the letter and the spirit. And so what's happening today is because Jesus is no longer attracted 
we have people that are becoming fascinated, that are becoming zealous about the latter. And they're just like, they're carrying the same spirit that the scribes and Pharisees carry. The religious system. Okay? They look for accusation. They look for false. They look for condemnation. They look to condemn. They can do everything but love. They can do everything but encourage. They can do everything but impart life. Okay? They can judge. They can expose. They can rebuke. They can condemn. They can do everything that the religious system and what the living of Messiah, what the religious spirit does. Okay? Because they have not seen his shape at any time, they have not heard his voice. And because they were never taught the principles of the doctrine of Christ, they were taught all of these other things and everything in exchange of the importance of first knowing him. Because the knowledge of him through relationship governs all letter. It governs all truth. It, it, listen, it turns the letter into the spirit. As the spirit of the Lord breathes upon the letter of the word, that's called revelation knowledge. When the spirit of the Lord breathes upon the letter of the word, that's called revelation knowledge. Okay? And so what happens is, you guys, he says, search the scriptures for them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify me. And then he told them this, but you will not come to me that you may find what? Life. Wow. Jesus said, he made a distinction between him and the scriptures. He said, you're caught up over the ladder, but you're missing me. You're ready to kill each other. You'll stone each other over the ladder. But you're missing my heart. You're missing my voice. You're missing my present will. You're missing my heartbeat. Because you have neither heard his voice, you have neither seen his shape. Listen, if they have heard his voice or seen his shape, then when a lady was caught in the middle of adultery, they would have been ready to kill her. They would have been on the same wavelength, on the same pathway, on the same flow that Jesus himself was on. Okay. We're full of the latter. They came to him talking about what Moses said in the law. And what the law said ought to be done. And then they asked Jesus, but what did you say? Wow. The living word. Say to me the living word. And so he said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And this is, this, his heart was broken when he talked to us. He said, but they are dead. Which testified. You know how I know his heart was broken? Because right before the cross, he went up to the mountain and he wept over Jerusalem. He said, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, thou which killeth the prophets and stoneth those that are sent to you. How often I have wanted to gather you as a hen, as a chick, but you would not. And he said that he failed to discern the time of their visitation and he wept over them. Praise God. The religious spirit. God loves people. Jesus loves people. But the religious spirit is able to grab a hold of people before, because they put things, they put formulas, they put acceptance, and we put everything before knowing him, spending the time to get to know him, building that foundation. Learning the doctrine of Christ. God is calling us to this place. To the Hebrew Christians, the Lord was saying, You've been here too long, it's time to be. But to our generation, God is saying, Recover the old landmark. He's saying, Listen, this is a place that you miss. This is a place. That you guys have missed. This is something that the evil one doesn't want you to do in this generation. He wants you to think that you're too advanced for Jesus. That there's more exciting things out there to learn about than him. He wants you to get bored when it comes to the one who died. Learning about him. He wants you to focus on everybody else who gets so much attention. And so much and so much feedback from folks who know other things and, and formulas and, and this and that and, and you know and and, 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 and going to this and, and how they're doing things and, and he wants you to be content with not knowing. Okay. Praise God. The 
asking you that. Please hear my heart. Because God is doing a great work in it. But the enemy is strategic in keeping Jesus out of your hands. And keeping the love of Jesus himself out of your heart. From keeping Jesus from the central focus, from making you feel dissatisfied when it comes to spending time and pulling back and shutting some people, some voices out, and just for the sole purpose of getting to know Him from a heart to heart communion and also through the Word of God. He does not want you to focus on Jesus at all. He doesn't want you to get that foundation. Because without that foundation, everything becomes twisted. Everything becomes warped. Everything becomes corrupted. Everything becomes shame. Everything becomes tainted. When he is not the source of it, because he is the light. There's no other foundation that can be laid except that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Praise God. And so I just want to encourage you guys to continue to be it. And when he says not laying the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ, I'm just going to look at more. Go to Hebrews chapter number 6 real quick. Verse 1. Let's pick back up there. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Say it with me, perfection. That word perfection means maturity. Let us go on to maturity. Let us go on to maturation. Let us go on to what the Bible calls being spiritual, being complete in heaven. Let us go on to fullness. Let us grow. Say let me grow. Okay? Let us progressively go from faith to faith, from glory to glory, and from strength to strength. Can I say this with, real, real quick? Your, your spiritual life was never meant to be a backward motion. Listen. Show me one thing that grows backwards. Tell me one thing that grows backwards. Show me a 10-year-old that becomes an 8-year-old. Show me an arm that gets longer and stronger. Suddenly, weeks later, it gets smaller and shorter. It doesn't exist. It does not exist. When it comes to our Christian walk, when it comes to our growth, when it comes to our evolving in Christ, Father never intended for it to go backwards. He never intended for it to go backwards. He intended for it to go on. Say it with me. Go on. Let us go on. That means that we're going forward. We're covering more ground. We are progressing. We're not looking back. We're not going back. And we're not turning back. We're going on, right? From one destination, from one place to another one, to a greater one, to a more progressive. Let us go on unto what? Perfection. Which doesn't mean, listen, being with our error, this word means maturity. Let us go on to completeness. Okay? Say that with me. I'm created to go on. Okay? If you find yourself going backwards or not going on, check your source. Check your root system. Check your foundation. Okay? Because the branch can't bear fruit of it, what? Of itself. Except it abides in the mind. Okay? So what happens is, you guys, our ability and timeliness in each season to go on is simply dependent upon our abiding our ability to abide in him. Who we're plugged in. Because, the listen, the light comes up through the roots and through the vine, and then it gives life to the branches. Right? And so, it's all about our foundation. It's all about what we're plugged in. Are you plugged into a system, or are you plugged into him? Are you plugged into a book, or a YouTube video, or are you plugged into him? Okay? What are we plugged? Are we plugged into anything? Am I plugged into the secular world? Am I plugged into Facebook? Am I plugged into social media? Am I plugged into just talking on the phone and wasting time? What am I plugged into? Okay. Am I abiding? What's my foundation? What am I grounded on? What am I standing on? Okay. What is the hope and the strength of my life? Okay. 
It's my stability. It's my job. It's my husband. It's my wife. It's my family. It's my accomplishment. What is our foundation? And so he says, let us go on unto perfection. Listen, not laying again the what? Foundation. Okay. So he told them, listen, don't go back and lay the foundation again. Okay. Matter of fact, he's, he's calling it the foundation, the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. That's what he's saying. This is the foundation. Okay. Let's let's build on this and go on to maturity. <laughs> See it? Let's build on this and go on to completeness. Let's build on this and go on to perfection. But how can the church build in our generation when no foundation has been laid about Christ, the anointed one of his anointed? How can we go higher knowing so little about? To a lot of believers that I talk to, Christ is a mystery to them. I'm talking about from an intimate standpoint. That have been believers for years, but still fret over hearing him, perceiving him, knowing that they're loved, knowing that they're saved, knowing that they're accepted. It's still a mystery. We go from highs to lows. We're happy one day, we're down the next day. We're feeling that God is with us one day, and we feel like He were forsaken the next. Like we're alone. We go from extreme joy to deep heaviness and depression. But you can't do that in Him. Praise God. When we're communing and walking with Him, man, if there's an intimate connection with Him, praise God. His listen, He is life. He is freedom. None of that. No bondage. No depression. No discouragement. No listen. No, no, no rejection. None of that can exist. No hopelessness. No despair can exist in his presence or in, in connection and in covenant with his life. None of that stuff can remain to a person that's intimate, entwined with him. Okay? But this is the key, you guys, to going on to perfection. Say that with me, perfection. God wants us to go on. He says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. But these are, listen, these are foundational truths that we need to know. These are things that from the beginning that we need, that it doesn't doctrine today that say that Christians don't have to repent. There's so many false doctrines that are against the scripture that because Jesus died on the cross once and for all, that we don't have to repent. Okay? That is so funny. There's so many scriptures that talk about the Christian's need to repent. But it says, not laying again the foundational principles of repentance from dead works. So he said in the very beginning, it's important that we know that when it comes to our own lifestyle, we have to repent. The works and the deeds of our flesh that lead to sin from the very beginning and coming to Christ, you got to repent. You just can't get saved. You just can't say, I, I got my own love. You got to repent. Repentance from that work. These are things that need to be turned from inwardly. Okay? This is a foundational principle, the doctrine of Christ. Repentance from dead works. Okay? Then he also said, and what? Faith toward God. Faith toward God to be what? To saints. Faith toward God to justify us. Faith toward God, praise God, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? And so here's the, here's, the, here's the reality, you guys. What he's saying is that is that releasing faith toward God without repentance from dead works is a no-go. Okay? There's a no-show of the reality of heaven when we do it that way. Notice the order. <laughs> repentance from dead works, and then what? Faith toward God. Let me show you what this looked like. i never forget, I was a young man in 1819, charged with capital murder on the inside. You know, the Spirit of the Lord came in that locked up cell, and I was full of demons and full of doctors and full of everything, and I had an encounter with the love of God. Praise God. Just came in that thing and just overshadowed me. So I broke down like any man who was the goodness of God. So I hit my knees I'm on the concrete of trembling and I'm shaking and I'm you know, stop coming out my nose and tears out of my mouth, and I and, and I hear the Lord for the first time, and I just feel this overwhelming love, and all I can do is tell God, Lord, I'm sorry. Father, I'm sorry. God, I didn't know I'm sorry. And the father said, You see, we'll put your trust in the streets of God. You put your trust in me, and I won't hurt you. He said, Lord, I'm sorry. 
I just kept saying, I'm sorry. Okay? Because the Bible says that the goodness of God leads man to what? Repentance. And godly sorrow work of repentance. Not to be repentant of. Okay? So that's what was working in my life. Okay? I'm sorry. God is sorry. So on the inside, I'm reflecting on my lifestyle. I'm reflecting on, on the game, man. I'm reflecting on the people that I left in blood. I'm reflecting on all the bad deeds and everything that I've done and how I live. And on the inside, I'm repenting. There's a repentant heart. There's contriteness there. Lord, I'm sorry. Father, I'm sorry. He wouldn't condemn me. He wouldn't say you're a loser. He wouldn't say you couldn't do anything right. He wouldn't say you do better than that. He was just loving on me. But the goodness of God led me to repentance. How my day works. And I'm saying, Lord, I'm sorry. And this is what I told God. I said, God, if you give me a second chance to live, I serve you for the rest of my life. It's 1998. That's what I told him. So I repented from dead works. Then I released faith toward what? Toward God. Okay. Faith toward God. And so that's the order. Now, Paul, the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, this is foundational. This is what people have to know. We're trying to bring people and get them connected to a genuine living God, and we're not even telling them the importance of repenting. Praise God. But there has to be a repentance from their works and faith toward God. That's a whole bunch of people. Let's know that it's one of the foundational principles of the doctrine of Christ. He went on to say baptism. There's so many baptisms, you guys. The Bible speaks about water baptism. The Bible speaks about the baptism of John. The book of Corinthians, first Corinthians, speaks about being baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Then the Bible speaks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in fire. Praise God. And so there are baptisms to be learned about, but these are foundational truths, praise God, for the believer to know as well. Praise God. And also of the laying on of hands. Praise God. We know that we can lay hands on the sick and they shall what? Recover. We see that Paul laid hands in Acts chapter 19 on someone to be filled with the Holy Ghost and they receive. But also laying on of hands is a way to commission and to ordain and to release ordinations into offices. The Bible says that we should lay hands simply on no man. Praise God. Paul told Timothy that. And so it's important that we understand that hands are a transitional debt. They're, 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 it's a transfer agent. Praise God. For a lot of things spiritually, and it's important that we understand the importance, praise God, of our hands, praise God, and also of the resurrection of the dead, praise God. We need to understand this. This is the foundational principle of the doctrine of Christ. Believers are not being taught about the resurrection of the dead. We know that Jesus rose from the dead, right? Praise God. We know, right? We know that Jesus rose, right? Praise God. Amen. We do know that Jesus rose from the dead. Praise God. But we're not also taught that when Jesus rose from the dead, there were other people that rose from the dead with him. Praise God. And go back and read it in the book of Matthew. Praise God. So those were those, God, who were of the first fruits. Praise God. After Christ and his coming. We also know that there's a common resurrection for the overcomers. Praise God. And then we also know that all of those who did not overcome will one day be raised to stand before God at the right throne judgment. Praise God. So there's more than one resurrection that we need to learn about. Praise God. We're not going to miss all of them. Praise God. We'll catch one for sure. Amen? All right. Praise God. And also, this is what I wanted to get to, and of eternal judgment. Say it with me, and of eternal judgment. And that's what we wanted to go. And this is one of the most shrouded, hidden, clouded truths that we ever want to understand. But it's all, listen, it's all in conjunction. It's all in line with truly knowing him and growing to know him. It's all in line with knowing the Lord intimately. Praise God. With knowing the Lord into it. And when we deal with judgment, we know that the Bible says judgment shall begin with the house of God first. We do know that he said that Zion shall be redeemed with judgment. We know that, that the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that we will judge angels. We also know that there is a, a, a judgment seat of Christ. We also know that there was a white from judgment, praise God. And so there's, there's certain truths you know, about judgment, praise God, that we have to understand as well. But these things are foundation. Say they would be foundation. Okay? But this last one, judgment, is the one that people have ran from the most, you know, more than anything. And by the help of God and the help of the Holy Spirit, we're going to dive into that thing step fast, and we're going to grow and pull and get the understanding that the Holy Spirit wants us to understand. So thank you for your patience and for the time to just let me uh, just go a little further, praise God, and cover that, praise God. And this we will do, I'll end it with this in verse 3, Hebrews 6. He said, and this we will do, but God permit. Amen. God bless you. Father, we just give you the praise and we give you the glory. We give you the honor. 
We thank you for your presence, God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you, Father, for the things that you have put forth today, God. And Father, I just pray, Father, a release over your people, God, a release of grace, God, to hear you, a release of grace to see you, a release of grace to know you like they've never known you before, God. I thank you for just captivating the hearts of your people once again. Father, I know that demons are angry, God, at the teaching and at the lifting up of your son. And Father, shine in the light, God, and breaking the glory, God, and deifying him, God, for who he is, God, and the importance of drawing him, him being formed in your people, God. I pray, Father, that you would confirm your word, God, to importance, God, by the power of your spirit, that every religious trait, every religious hook and shackle, God, and oppression, God, and chain, God, that may grip your people, God, and keep them back in fear. Every power of religion we break in Jesus' name, every effect of the letter of the law that has wounded, that has controlled, and that has Father, held hostage of people. We command every chain to be broken, God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, let the hunger for Christ, God, the Son of the living God, arise out of the inside of your people. May there be a fire to know you, God, a zeal to know you, a passion to know you, a pursuit, God, that's endless, God, that's fervent, God, that's persistent, that's steadfast, God, that's immovable. I pray, Father, that people will ask and seek and knock, God, and press into you, God, with importunity, God, and resilience. God, in consistency, God, that they may strive to know you, God, in fullness, God, in completeness, God. I just decree a realignment, God, of foundations, God. I pray, God, that you repent the preachers, God, and to those that began to build in you, God, but that were tricked and seduced, God, out of a focus, God, and out of your presence, God, and out of relationship and out of communion with you. I just thank you for restoration and receiving them back into your bosom, God, back into the place of intimacy, God, and fellowship with your person and with your spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God. And I just decree an expulsion, God, of every false foundation, God, and a breaking away from every religious system, God, that seeks to kill, steal, and destroy them, God, in Jesus' name. As your word declares, God, I pray that they will come to you, that they may have life, that they may know life, God. I thank you for opening the eyes of their heart, the eyes of their understanding, God, and making them confident in your voice and what they perceive and what you say and what you speak and what you reveal, God. We thank you, Father, for Christ being on the inside of your people, God. And I just decree, Father God, that the true light is now shining, that they know your voice, God, that every ear is being unstopped, God, to hear the voice of your spirit, that every eye is being opened, God, by the anointing of the Holy Ghost, God, as you reveal your Son in a special way, God. Manifest your glory, God. Manifest your purpose. Manifest your Son, God. And Father, grab the hearts of the children, God, and turn them back to you, the Father, God, once again, God, in Jesus' name, God. And we thank you for light, God, and for new beginnings is coming, God, and your people becoming stronger, God, and more solid and more stable, God, and abiding in you, God, as your word declares in the book of Isaiah, God, that they may be oaks of righteousness, Lord God, the planting of the Lord, God. Thank you for doing it, God, according to your word, and thank you, Father God, for making yourself known, God, throughout the earth, God, and to you be the glory, the honor, and the praise, God, now and forever, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, we thank you, and we do pray. Amen. Praise God. Amen and amen. Praise God. Well, God bless you, family, people of God, awesome, 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 awesome people. Praise God. Say anything? Praise God. I want to thank you guys for the fellowship. Praise God. We will not be doing a new destiny, just so you know, next Thursday. I've got a prophetic conference to minister in and for man, but we'll be on the following week. So pray that uh, God ministers something to you that can help you. And strengthen you and help you just uh, abide and become stronger in him. Enjoy the fellowship, enjoy the time. We love you. God bless you.